morning. Welcome. I know many people are online today. Um, hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, I just want to welcome everybody that is at home, the one that are here. I want to start first with our announcement for our coming events coming up. Um, remember, we try at 9.30, be here and pray for uh, our church, our city, and if there's any need around us, among us, this is a good time to join us. Second is the prayer and fasting. This month on Wednesday, we are praying and fasting. Fasting, uh, if you have any question, we were talking on Wednesday, this past Wednesday about what it is fasting, why we do it, how we do it, uh, or prayer, please send us a message. We would love to talk with you. And we also remind you, everybody that is joining us, with that we pray for each of us that are part of Sojourn to grow deeper in God's word, in prayer, evangelism, and discipleship. And we also pray for our need as a church, uh, specifically for a better place that we can meet to have a space for kids and also a kids director. And also pray for Northeast Portland, especially for Alberta Art District and Concordia neighborhood. The other um, is about a gospel community that is us on Wednesday, the next, is that the same one? There it is. The gospel community on Wednesday at seven, we are meeting at our house, that is the address. Um, so we would love to have you there. Um, so I just want to remind, I know many people that came and visit us, they ask us, where is your offering bags? Uh, where can I give? So I just want to remind people, we have in the back our box that says Sojourn, or many people are giving online, so those are the two ways you can join. We have this one for our Tyson offering, uh, that is to put in the box, or um, also if you are new and you just come for the first time, we have our Connect card, ask us about it. So let me read, before we pray, to start Psalm 24. Um, I've been devotion, doing my devotion through Psalm, so I've been digging and getting into them, and I just love this Psalm 24 that talks about the King of Glory. The earth is the Lord and the fullness therefore, the world and those who dwell their ears. For he has founded upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart and who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitful. He will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seeks the face of the God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient door, that the King of glory might come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord is strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient door, that the King of glory might come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. So um, I just want to give a little brief uh, about this passage that and the Psalm David is talking about who will come into his presence. It doesn't matter that we um, sometimes are not that clean of him, I know, but what it matters, we can go back to him and ask him to clean us and depend on him. Uh, so it's not a perfect person to come to his presence. That is what we are aware, but he, the King of Glory, is the one we can come time after time and get this um, relationship. And today he wanna have a relationship with us. So that is what I take from this psalm. And please join me in praying today. Thank you, Father, for um, this morning that we get to join as the body online or in person to worship you with our song, with our uh, with Bible reading, with learning from you, 
with talking with brothers and sisters, for straining ourselves in the midst of the time we're living. I pray for everybody that is not here and the ones here that you can be working in our hearts and put us in unity as we uh, seek to love you more and to um, give you yourself known in this city. I pray for uh, Ben as we are going to start worshiping you through songs. I pray that we can focus on you and that you can talk to our hearts. I pray for Matt and we will hear the word that you can fill his mouth and that you can be um, salt and light to our life today. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Let's go ahead and stand up and praise God this morning. song is a newer one called Gratitude, and um, obviously we have so much to be grateful for even during a time of unsureness about Omicron and things going on. We still have a God who we can trust completely, so let's sing these praises of gratitude to Him. i 
mountain top, I can see you so clear when it's all around. You stay by my side as the sun goes down. So sufficient, you're all-knowing, you know everything about us inside and out, but you still love us in open arms. You welcome us into your family. So as we explore what it means to be family this morning, will we be reminded that because of Jesus, we are enough, and we can live fully alive in you because of your power. praise you and we welcome you this morning. In Jesus' name we ask you for this. Amen. 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 Gratitude. That new song that, that Ben, new to us anyway, song that Ben sang for us. 
short down a few notes. Um, the gratitude, said nothing else, we have nothing else, so we sing this hallelujah. The uh, part that stuck out to me in that song is that it says, I throw up my hands. And I think we could take that in multiple ways. I'm not sure exactly how he meant it, but we could think like, some of us like to be more expressive in worship and throw up our hands and maybe even sway a little bit from time to time. I've always joked that I'm Baptocostal, and so my Pentecostal side will raise this hand, my Baptist side, and pretty much stuck to that so far. Um, and so, but, but as I was thinking about this morning, I was just thinking about kind of personalizing a little bit. Uh, there was some uh, technical difficulties this morning. There's no Wi-Fi in the building this morning. And so I just, my posture was kind of like, man, I'm just throwing up my hands. And, and this is just to be transparent. I think it's good uh, for leaders to be transparent if they can be. Like, I'm over there starting kind of like, I'm throwing my hands. I don't know if I really want to be here. <laughs> you know, I'm frustrated. Things weren't going how I had hoped they would go and how they planned. It wasn't as the smooth that I had, had anticipated. I mean, I, I put my clothes out Saturday night, so it's Sunday morning. I'm, like, ready to go. And then you have these things you just can't control, you know. And I think it's kind of where we're at as a society and at a place with, you know, Omicron and COVID. It's just like parts just fell out of our hands. I think as far as our posture, when it comes to God, like that's the place that we need to be, is to throw up our hands and just say, hey, God, I'm, I'm, we've got gratitude because we've got nothing else. We've got you, we've got nothing else. Uh, and then that, that's the last song that Ben sang, said, I will be content in every circumstance. And so for me, that was a little sermonette that was preached to me this morning. So you may not think about that sometimes, but the words that we sing matter, and, and the, the songs that Ben carefully selects and prayerfully selects each week, like it matters, and so it guides us into that. And so I just want to point that out to you guys, and that could be the sermon itself. I could pray and we could go home. Uh, but we are in our second week of our annual Vision and Value series, uh, which is just a fresh reminder for who we are and what we are about as a church. Now, we started last week with our starting place for everything, which is what? When Gerald was here, I went back and watched. You guys answered him. So what? what's the starting place for everything at Sojourn? Uh, the gospel. The gospel. Okay, man, if we got that one wrong, then we're going offline, and we're going to do something different this morning. The gospel. And we saw that within the gospel lies the power of hope for humanity, what we call salvation for all people at all times and all places, including us today. And that is, that is good news. This way we're going to look at our second value. What's our second value? Anybody know? Family. Okay. Woo! Pass the test. I'll go ahead and give you guys a sneak peek for next week. Gospel family mission. Okay? So family is our second value. And I want you to know on the front end that there's an agenda with this whole series. So each week is that we would maybe capture that a little bit better. And so my agenda is I want you to love Jesus first and foremost and his gospel message. But I also want you to love his bride, the church. You can go ahead and turn your Bibles if you have them to Ephesians chapter 4. We'll start in verse 1, Ephesians 4, verse 1. We'll get there in just a few minutes. Now, some of the, the specific things I mentioned this morning might sound a little familiar, and that's because at times when we're going through different series, it'll bring up these similar themes or topics. And, and our uh, We Are the Church series, I think it was actually our very first message. Some of these same components were in that message uh, just naturally as we talk about what it means to be a church. And so some of that part might sound uh, familiar, but if you're like me, I need a fresh reminder uh, because I forget things. Uh, Andrea and I just started watching the fourth season of Ozark. And I was like, do I need to go back and watch the third season? Because it's been so long. I remember a lot of the things, but there's some specific details and storylines that I might have um, for, forgotten. And so one of our values at Sojourn is family. Because the church is not like family. The church is family. Now, I don't know what you think when you hear that. I don't know what that might mean to you. But hopefully we can unpack what that means for us here at Sojourn. For me, this means that every time we walk to a gathering like this one, or on a Wednesday night at a gospel community, that in many ways it's like a mini family reunion. You know, think about family reunions. Now, sometimes you want to see the people there, sometimes you don't. That's a different topic, but let's pretend you want to see most of these people. You walk in and you think like, man, this is great. I haven't seen this person maybe all week, or I haven't seen them in a couple weeks because people attend once a month you know, in, in, in the Portland area, and that's a regular tender. Or I had a miss because of sickness or quarantine, and it's like a fa mini family reunion. And so we are family. And God has given us this need for community. Whether you're an introvert or an extrovert. I know the most people think, oh, extroverts have this need for community. I went snowboarding with an introvert on Monday, and we kind of talked about that a little bit. But we all have a need for community. We express that differently. I'm a little more outward in my expression of that. And what's great, though, is as we look at it as Christ followers, is that like God scratched that itch for us. 
He gave us that need. He gave us that desire. But then he also gave us the way to meet that desire, the church. Our new family, once we are in Christ, it says we are brothers and sisters. I know it's hard to maybe think about this, but really it goes deeper than our blood family. And I've experienced this as I've traveled the world. If you've traveled to other countries and you visit with other Christians and other churches there, it's like I'll, I'll, I'll meet people. I love that we live in India because you call people old and auntie and, and, and uncle. And it's like, man, they're like really getting this family concept. And if they're kind of more of a similar age, it's brother and sister. And I could always forget people's names, so it was a lot easier there to say brother and sister. And you just don't want to offend somebody if they're too close in age and you call them the older, the older thing. But the fact is they, they get this idea of, of family and community. I've often said other countries and cultures seem to just get this a lot better than we do as Americans. But in the church, we should fight for this because this is how it's designed for us to be. I think about one of the aspects of the last couple of years of what has made things so challenging for us is, is we've had to keep isolation periods for longer periods of time than maybe we had thought we might. You know, we thought maybe a couple weeks, then we're good, and then maybe a few months. And, and here we are, and some of us haven't seen certain family members in a couple of years now. And it may even go longer. And then some of us have had exposures or, or sickness, and we've had to quarantine for a couple of weeks, and we're like, oh, this is really tough and challenging. I almost forgot. And so in many ways, what we've been robbed of is the blessing of the church community during, during this season, during this, this era of life that we live in. I think one of our generation's greatest illustrations of our longing for community is social media. I know a few people that don't have it, but most of us do. And if you're like me, you have Twitter and you have Facebook and you have Instagram. I refuse to sign up for anything else. I'm sticking with those three. But we all want to be known and we all want to know others. So we get friend requests or we'll request others to be friends. We all want more friends and followers. You know, and some of us probably spend too much time on those platforms. And what that's showing is I have this longing for community. And I can't find anywhere else, so I'm going to try to find it digitally. Now, there's a number of reasons why people aren't deeply invested in a church family. First, some people have been hurt by the church or maybe hurt by leaders. That's a very real thing. We want to be sensitive to that. But my prayer, my hope is that you would fight for healing, restoration, and you can receive the care that you, the injustice maybe you experience at the hands of some leaders. Second, now this is huge in our culture, in our city especially, some people are pro-church when it's convenient. Okay, I know this kind of steps on some toes and some schedules a little bit. But basically, I'm all about church as long as there's not something else better happening. It was foggy this morning. In some ways, that's a benefit to the church. Because this time of year, if it's sunny, I always know, like, sun's out, less people are going to be at a gathering on a Sunday. Because they want to be out in the, the sun on that Sunday. Okay? A little cheesy joke there. But as long as there's not something better going. You know, the waves are good, I might, I might want to go surf. Man, we just got, a, like, fresh snow at the mountain, I want to go snowboarding. I want to go hiking. I want to, you know, all these things. So if it's convenient, there's maybe nothing better for my attention. Sure, I'm all about it. Is that how you treat your family? Maybe some of you it is. You probably have a messed up family life. Third, some of you love the idea of church. We have very little relationship with other Christ followers within a local church. We kind of talk about these, these lone ranger Christians. It's me and Jesus. And I love Jesus. And you would say you love the church, but you really love the church if you don't have relationships with others in the church. His bride. For some of you are open to learning about the importance of church, you just simply haven't been taught too much. That's why we say we're a family. We learn this together. It's part of that journey that we're on together. Fifth, some of you might have been loving and serving the church faithfully, but you find yourself in a phase of maybe burnout or exhaustion. Okay? I'll be transparent. That's where I find myself sometimes. Like as I'm lugging this thing up the steps, I'm like, God, do I really want to do this? Maybe I just stand up there and not have a podium. <laughs> this thing can be heavy. Uh, you know, and some of these things, so you kind of find yourself there. And once again, as we're, as we're family, hopefully we can lean on each other and say, you know what, I'm just kind of feeling like this. I'm kind of, all I have is to throw up my hands, and we want to be there to rally around one another. And it's like some of you might just love the church, but you just aren't always sure how to love it. How do I tangibly love my brothers and sisters? How do we actually do this life together? And so regardless of where you fall on that list, I imagine we all fall somewhere on there, maybe multiple spots on there. Hopefully we can recapture this value of church as family. And so the main point of our sermon is that belonging to a healthy church family, notice I added the word healthy there, we, means maintaining unity, not uniformity, but unity. We're unified in the big things, using our unique gifts to serve one another. We'll hopefully see that we've all been gifted uniquely. God's given us areas that, that are really to serve him and, and to serve the church. 
and that growing in spiritual maturity by advancing Jesus' mission together. And so we're basically unified, we have these unique gifts, and we are on a mission together. And so we're going to break this message down in three main parts. First, we're going to see a healthy church family is marked by spiritual unity. We're going to see, once again, not uniformity, but what does it mean to be unified spiritually as a church family? Second, a healthy church family is marked by spiritual diversity. That we're not all the same. <laughs> that we have these unique skill sets and unique gifts and, and areas that we can use to better uh, the life of the church and then advance the kingdom of God. And third, a healthy church family is marked by spiritual maturity. What does it mean to mature in our relationship with God? What does it look like to mature as a family of God? And so we'll start with our first point. Is a healthy church is marked by spiritual unity. Look at chapter 4 of the book of Ephesians. And we're going to start at verse 1. It says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And so Paul, he's talking to the, the Ephesians. So we've gone through the book of Ephesians before, but it's, it's been a few years now. And he calls the Ephesian Christians and us to live a life worthy of our calling. And about our calling, you know, they use language like we were adopted in Christ. So we're now part of Christ's family. That we're looked at as holy and righteous because of Christ. And that we are to be united together as his children. Now Ephesus was a pagan city. And in a pagan city, humility was regarded as distasteful. Like this is not a, a, a trait that you want to have. But for the Christian to live a life of humility, gentleness, and patience, and most of all love, that's what we're called to live, to live out these characteristics. So it says to live a life worthy of your calling, saying live in this way, be marked in this way. And so would, you know, ask yourself, do the people around me, would they say that I'm, I have humbleness, that I show humility? Would they say that I'm gentle with them? Would they say that I show them patience? Because these are the manners in which Paul is saying you are worthy to walk. And you're only worthy because of Christ in you, but this is how you are to walk out and live your life. And he also includes the means by which believers are to conduct their lives. He says that we are to bear with one another. In the last part of uh, verse 2. He says we are to walk in a manner worthy of our calling. And that we are eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit. Now in other words, when we look at this list, we are to live and to look like who? Jesus. Good job, Elliot. We are to live and look like Jesus. We are to conduct our lives with love as we bear with one another and work towards unity by the Spirit. Easier said than done, right? I mean, even if you're just in a nuclear family relationship, just a husband and a wife, and then add a kid or kids to that, maybe some rabbits and a fish, a dog and a guy, things can get hard, right? But then you take about like even our, our spiritual, our church family. So why is it hard to live this way? Because people in relationships are difficult. You are difficult. But I am difficult. Okay? I can hold up a mirror and say, you are difficult. That's why. And here's the truth. We've all been hurt by people. You've had that person in your life, maybe who was your BFF, and you never can imagine things being any differently. And now they've deleted you from social media. Uh-oh. They went there. That's when you're like, oh, no. <laughs> they delete you from social media. And now if they see you on the street, they pretend they don't know who you are. Okay? Am I, am I alone in that? What this passage tells us within the church family, now this is how, you, we shouldn't expect the church, outside the church, to act like the church. So if you're not in Christ and you've experienced that with somebody and they're not a Christian, that, that's how they should be acting. They're acting in a manner worthy of their calling. But we in Christ should act differently, even towards that person. But especially when it comes to two Christians together, this passage tells us within the church family, this should never happen. Not as brothers and sisters in Christ. Because we are to maintain the unity that has already been given to us and provided for us in the Spirit of God. He continues verse 4. He says, there is one body and one spirit. Just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. And so we as the body of Christ 
have been called to really like a city within a city. You know, we're, we're a light that's set up on a hill. Other parts of Ephesians, it, it refers to us being like a new race. Think about the Jews and the Gentiles, groups that hate each other, came together. Now they have a brand new identity that we carry with us in Christ. And that we no longer live for our kingdom, that we live for his kingdom. This is what we now live for. Which says how you posture your life. Is this, is this, are you living for God's kingdom or for your kingdom? Because you're living for his kingdom, you're going to live for his ways, and you're also going to be unified with brothers and sisters in Christ. Because ideally, when you think about a, a vision of, a, of the church, but then a church, is that we're going after this vision together. And that God's given us, once again, those unique roles to play. This means that we no longer live for ourselves and for our needs as we are called to this one hope that Paul is pointing us to. And that we share a collective identity in Jesus. Isn't, isn't there something unique? Like, because we are Christ followers, I don't know about you, but once again, I'm an extrovert, so I'll just talk to random strangers. I'll meet them somewhere. But all of a sudden, you'll find out, like yesterday, we were at a restaurant in Cascade Locks, and the waitress had a tattoo. This is Romans 14, 8. Our other tattoos were like pine trees and stuff. And I was like, I like your tattoo. And she's like, oh, thanks. You know, it's the Pacific Northwest. And she came back and said, no, I meant the other tattoo. And we got chatting, and she's like, oh, it's always great to meet Christ followers. You know, it's like this, like, you almost let your guard down a little bit. Now you should fully trust them, but you kind of let your guard, like, oh, we can relate to each other, and we can relate to how it can be really challenging to be a Christ follower out here in this area of the country. Because we share this collective identity. It says we've been given one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. And so Paul's point is this reality that we all share the same story. So while our individual stories of how we came to Christ are what we call our testimony sometimes, that may look different. That may look nuanced. You may have come to Christ at a very, very young age. You may have come to Christ as a young adult. You may have gone through a period of just all-out rebellion and fleeing from God. All of our individual stories are unique, but they all ultimately point back to Christ, and we're united in Christ, and now we're part of the same family. And so it doesn't matter how bad your sins were compared to how bad my sins were or how bad someone else's sins were, because they've all been made washed and anew and united in Christ into this family. One struggle I have as I watch our generation is when things get uncomfortable or they get difficult or they get inconvenient, many people just leave. I wasn't comfortable, so I left. Now, I'm not saying comfortable in like a dangerous sense, but, you know, they were gathering every Sunday or they were doing this or they were asking this of me. Um, or things get difficult. Well, that person kind of looked at me the wrong way. Or they didn't answer my text message, so I'm not, I'm not so sure now. Or they just get inconvenient for you. People just leave. And unfortunately, our generation has done a really good job of just making this acceptable and normal. That this is just okay. This is what we call, when you see kind of the, uh, we call it like church transfer growth. Where people just get upset with something that happened to their church family and they'll leave and they'll go to another church family. Once again, there's a time and a place. And I'm not saying every, I can't nuance that for you this morning up here. But we could talk for, at coffee or lunch or something. But there is a time and place. But people just kind of like, well, I didn't like what they said that, this, that week. There's people that are sending church who've been part of that church for 30 years. And, and as soon as, I should have touched that, I was messing that up. As soon as these things became a thing, it was like, I'm, I'm done. They're not going to tell me I had to wear a mask. And other people were like, well, we have to wear a mask. We're not doing enough of it, right? And this is a different part of the country, so they're, they're not still, they're not wearing them like we are this morning. But after 30 years, you just, that's what, that's what it was that upset you? Really? I don't think it's supposed to be normal for the family of God. I don't think it's supposed to be normal in a church family. I think we're supposed to, to, to stick around and to let the, the big issues be the big issues and the small issues be the small issues and then let there be some room for kind of gray areas, but to fight to stay together as a church family. And so hear this. If you are part of Sojourn, we are siblings. We're a family in Jesus, so we need to be known for that. We need to be known for our unity under Christ. Now, once again, I know some of us have broken families, God is all of our families are broken. We say I come from a broken family, like all families are broken. Doesn't this mean that your parents are divorced? And that's what we typically think about that. But like all families are broken because all families have sin. Mm -hmm. Promise you, any family reunion, any Thanksgiving, any Christmas, a debate breaks out, an argument breaks out, a, a yelling of some kind breaks out. Every family is broken, okay? So let's just get that straight. We're all from broken families. But in the church, we have Jesus, and Jesus is not broken. Jesus has made us unified under him. And so we want to be siblings that sojourn. We say, family, we want to be siblings who stay, who wrestle through issues together, whether it's cultural things or pandemic things or difference of just we're not sure about some of this. 
that we wrestle through these issues together. We have some hard conversations as we are an authentic family. You realize it's easy to find bad in people. If we sit down for a cup of coffee and you're looking for the bad in me, you'll find that bad. Now, if you want to save your time and save the cup of coffee, just talk to Andrea first and then you'll have kind of a leg up. <laughs> but when you're looking for it, it's easy to find the bad in people. But as a family, we want to assume the positive intent when dealing with one another. Have conversations. I think a lot of it comes down to that. And finally, as a family, we, we need to be eager to forgive people and use, our, uh, use and experience mercy and grace with one another. Because Christ first extended that to us when we didn't deserve it. I love how C.S. Lewis says this. He says, to be a Christian means to forgive the inexcusable because Christ has forgiven the inexcusable in you. Right? That's what it means. To forgive the inexcusable because Christ has forgiven the inexcusable in you. And so first, as a church family, we want to be marked by spiritual unity. Second, a healthy church family is marked by spiritual diversity. Let's pick up in verse 11. It says, And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. So when Christ eventually descended up into heaven, ascended up into heaven, he left us, one, he left us with the Holy Spirit, praise God, but he also left us with a spiritually diverse set of gifts for the purpose of building up the church. Theologian Marcus Barth, he calls this the constitution of the church, and he considers this the way the church is to be organized for gospel movement, specifically referring to what is known as apest. How many of you are familiar with apest when I say that term? No. Nobody? Okay. So basically, apest is apostolic, prophetic, evangelist, shepherd, teacher. Now, different tribes define these different ways. Uh, let me give you a brief definition of each. First, the apostles. Apostles broadly defined as sent out ones. Now, there was the original, what I call capital A apostles, like literally walked with Jesus on face to face. All those are gone because Jesus <laughs> ascended up into heaven. But broadly speaking, sent out ones would be kind of what they call little a apostolic that are sent out to proclaim the gospel. And so we know that... Um, I don't know if it's a secure or unsecure country that you're eventually going to. Ben and Julie are eventually going to be sent out, like, right? They're going to go and do like a little a apostolic ministry to take the gospel to a place that needs it. Um, even, even moving here, some people say Matt's doing the apostolic work of starting a new church in the area. Not that there's not churches here, but in a, in a new area to proclaim that message. Second, we see the, the prophet, uh, simply one who communicates God's truth to God's people. Third, we see the evangelist, those gifted in proclaiming the gospel. Now, special note on this one. We are all called to evangelize. So this isn't like a, whew, I don't think I have that one. And you're like, whew, I don't have to do this one. <laughs> we all are called to evangelize. But some are uniquely gift, gifted in the area of evangelism. And we must recognize that. Fourth, we have the shepherd, and, shepherd pastor, one who oversees and cares for God's people. And then finally, we have the teacher, one who instructs God's people in God's truth. And so this is what Paul meant in verse 7 when he says, But God's grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. And so the purpose of these diverse gifts, the, the purpose of these diverse roles is for certain individuals to, to live them out to build up the church as Christ builds his church. And so simply put, we see the leader's role is equipping. And so that's, that's a part of my role is to help equip us as a church. How do we learn scripture? How do we pray? How do we fast? So sometimes you might wonder, why are we doing these things? Why does Matt keep coming up with all these initiatives? Well, hopefully we keep them based in the Bible, but part of my role is to help equip us all to do those things. And then Christ's role is what? Building. It says Christ will build the church. And so being an evangelist isn't just about sharing the gospel with people. A big part of that role is helping others share the gospel with their set of friends and family and community. In a similar way, being a teacher isn't just about being rooted in knowledge and understanding of what God has declared. Being a teacher is helping others teach those who they're discipling to walk with Jesus. And so it kind of assumes here that we're all doing these things. But, you know, once again, the leader of the teacher would help say, hey, but now you go and teach this to others. You've probably heard a phrase like this, disciples making disciples that make disciples. Uh, ben works with a group called Contagious Disciple Making. And so it's like part of that's built into it. It's kind of assumed that we're doing this. But then those unique roles go, we're helping others be equipped in this way so that they can go and do these things. Now, if you don't consider yourself a leader, you know, we all are leaders. Are, are, some people are like, I'm not a leader. Or you don't think you have a role on this list. 
Don't tune me out. It doesn't give you permission to say, oh, I'm not, I'm not, on that. I'm not an apest. I'm not one of those, those things. Because while it's true that it says Christ has given leaders unique roles to play within that to equip the entire body, it says that he, Christ, also gives the church. So look back at verse 12. What it says is that he gives the gift of you to the body. And so most often when people hear the term ministry, they think of someone like myself, someone who went to seminary, who, who went through uh, different trainings, and who said, I'm going to start a church. You know, and it may have a title pastor next to it. But that's not exactly what this text is saying here. Sure, it refers to equippers, those who are supposed to function that way, but it says in verse 12, to equip the saints for the work of ministry. Who are the saints? That's us. us, the church. Now, if you have a Catholic background, you're like probably getting ready to name one of the saints, right? Uh, I've got a Catholic uh, cousin who's, who's a priest, and we're, we're similar age. I listened to an a interview he did recently, and they were talking about the saints of the Catholic church difference from the protestants and some of what he said i, I agree with i said there's some there's some agreement but and i don't think he watches my messages but if you do i mean this is where we really dif- disagree because we're all saints according to this passage in the new testament we are saints not just for dead people who have proved themselves because reality is they all live messed up lives as well and it was only in jesus and so we are the saints and so in other words if you are in christ if you would say i am a christ follower i put my yes on the table then you are a gift to the church and you are called to ministry. Now, for some of you, that might be a scary idea, <laughs> maybe a brand new idea. Like, wait a minute, I'm not planning on quitting my job and going to seminary. That's not what this means. And so before you freak out and, and run out and find a different church to go to, where some won't tell you this, some will say, just come, bring everyone, I'll do all of the work. But the day that you became a Christian is the day that you were called in full-time Christian ministry. That's what this means. I mean, we look at the Great Commission, go and therefore and make disciples of all nations. It doesn't say go, therefore, if you're going to stop what you're doing and go to seminary and get a Bible degree and get an MDiv and do all these things. No, it says go, therefore, you collectively go and do these things. And so the day that you became a Christian is the day that you entered into full-time Christian ministry as a tax auditor, as a coach, as an artist, as a student, as a nanny, as a security guard, as a construction worker, as a hospitality specialist, as a mom, as a dad, as a husband. And on and on and on the list goes. Whatever you do in life, wherever your vocational paycheck comes from, you are to leverage that as full-time ministry. Because here's the, here's the, like, the secret to that, is you are in different um, areas of life that sometimes a minister couldn't get to, especially in, a, in closed cultures. But you, you know, you're, you're rubbing shoulders with people or Zoom chats and video calls with people that some of us don't ever have a chance to. And so you're, you're able to leverage that. You know, you see, sojourn is built on the foundation of ordinary people doing ordinary things with gospel intentionality. That's how we want to live our lives. It's just being intentional with our lives. It doesn't make us any different, any better than anybody else. But we just want to be intentional with where God has called us in life. And when we see opportunities, take those opportunities. And so my job as your shepherd teacher is to equip, hopefully equip all of us. And if you're part of sojourn, then your job is to minister. And so you are a minister of this church. That's part of the reason that at the end of almost every gathering, Ben will finish that final song, and he'll say something to the extent of, okay, sojourn, go and be the church. It's not just a little slogan and, and cliche. I know it can sound that way, but this is why. Because we're all called to be ministers. And so it's kind of like, okay, we've got, our, we've got our, our play. We've got our playbook. We know what we're called to do. Now go and be the church. Go and live this out the rest of your week, wherever it is that God has you. And so second, we see a healthy church is marked by spiritual diversity. And third, a healthy church is marked by spiritual maturity. Pick up verse 13. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness, and deceitful schemes. So what we see is living in response to this reality that it is ours in Christ, Jesus, from verses 12 through 14, results in unity and maturity as children of God. And so verse 13 tells us the ultimate picture of maturity is Christ. And so the goal for us is to be like Jesus, and that we should long for maturity individually and corporately. And then Paul points out, he says, you need, points out our need to grow in our knowledge of truth. 
And he uses this language, he says, as, as a result, to no longer be like little children thrown around by every wind of doctrine. Now think about children. We have a few in the room this morning. You can probably hear them at home if you're on the live stream. <laughs> children can be easily deceived. You ever watch that show? Uh, I think it's the guy from Dateline who does it, where like, like, they'll pull up at a park and they'll offer kids donuts or candy, and the kids will get in the car with a stranger. What would you, yeah, what would you do? I think maybe what the show's called. I've always said, like, my kids are they're enough outgoing, they love sweets, that they would totally jump in the car with a stranger if they had a box of Krispy Kreme donuts. <laughs> so children are easily deceived. And false teachers, what this is saying is they can creep into our midst and they can toss them around like waves of the sea. If you go down to the Oregon coast, it's always just like, it looks like a storm brewing. And they're prone to believe things like, and this is what, when we kind of relate to what Paul means in our knowledge of truth, all religions are the same. If you're a good person, you'll go to heaven. The Bible is just one book, book among many other religious books. We believe in the idea of the resurrection, but not actually a bodily resurrection. So there's a danger in those things. So if you're young in your faith, or you haven't been equipped in your faith, you haven't been trained, you might, you might believe those things. You know, children are taught as they grow up. If my oldest son sitting here on the front row, he's 10, he'll be 11 here in a couple months. If I said, hey, Elliot, I need you to drive your brothers to school tomorrow. Now, he might get excited about that opportunity, but I, I wouldn't do that. Why, why wouldn't I do that? Because I'm not old enough to drive. Because you're not old enough to drive. Because he's 10 years old. Well, that's why I wouldn't do that. He has to mature and has to learn over the next five to six years how to drive, how to properly drive, how to do it in a safe manner. And then I'll toss him the keys. Although if we only have one car still, I don't know if I will. But we'll toss him the keys and say, drive your brothers to school. Now, Paul has the same hope for us as Christ followers. We enter the Christian life. We enter this family as infants. But we grow into maturity in Christ through the word. And I'm firmly convinced that one way Christ followers are being tossed around today, of kind of going back and forth and getting away from orthodoxy and giving into aspects that the culture wants us to give into, the very thing that Paul is talking about here is the lack of commitment to the body, to the church family. I'm convinced that's a huge part of it. Because we're, we're isolating ourselves off in vacuums and, and, and hearing things that we want to hear. Trust me, if there's something that you're, you question about Scripture and, and the Bible, Christianity, and you want to find a group that's going to kind of lay on that or stand on that platform, you'll find them. They're out there. There's books about them. There's blogs. There's, I, can, I can point you there. I don't want to, but I can. But I think it's the lack of commitment to a body. A body who says... You know, if you're ever in school, they say there's no dumb question. And you're always like, yeah, I'm the one to raise my hand. Everybody laughed at me. But there really are no dumb questions. It's okay to wrestle through things, but to do that in community, to wrestle through it together. And so one may ask, well, how involved should I be in the church? Based on these verses, a better way to phrase that question is, how much do you want Christ to be part of your life? How much do you want to know him? That's how much you should be involved in the church. Because he's giving you this community to do it with. It was never meant to do alone. Because according to Ephesians, now when we look at the full book, the church is the plan A. There is no plan B. That's where God put his power. That's where he lives with his body, the church, whether you like it or not. And so I said, how are we going to reach Portland? Through God's plan A. What's his plan A? The church. That's how we're going to reach Portland. But it's the, work, the church working holistically. Once again, we are sent out and we, we, are, we are by ourselves for moments, for days. But then we come back together. It's a church gathered and scattered, gathered and scattered. And it continues to work that way. God designed it that way, but that we're family. So that when your week all of a sudden is going crazy or hectic or bad, you can reach out to one of us and maybe say, can you come do this with me? Can I have a shoulder to cry on? Can, I, can you just come be with me? Whatever's going on, that we have that in our family. And then Paul wraps up first, verse 15, 16. It says, rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way to him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Truth is what leads to Christian maturity. And Paul defines that as that's how you grow up into Christ. And Christ being the head that leads. So we say, who's the, who's the head of sojourn? Christ is the head of sojourn. And we all have a role to play within that head. And he's the one that directs us. He guides our body, his church. 
And so Paul is saying that we need each other in our lives. Because here's the reality. We all have areas of brokenness. We all have places where we are blind, where we are vulnerable, and sometimes even just plain right stupid. Not I always tell my kids, you're not stupid, but some of your actions sometimes can be stupid. We have those areas, every single one of us. I have a friend who, who recently did something in a moment of what I call vulnerability, weakness, that was sinful. I don't say that as a way to pass judgment. I say that as a way to say that that could have been any of us, myself included. And this is one of the many reasons as a family we need each other in our lives. It's hard to live the Christian life. It really is. It's hard to walk in a manner worthy of the calling that we've been called to, especially in a city where you're surrounded majority of the time by people who aren't in Christ, who are living the way that they should live because they don't identify themselves with Jesus. And this is why we encourage you not to be here on Sundays, not just because we want more people in the room, but just because of building each other up. That's why we encourage you to be a part of the gospel community. That's why we encourage you, if you're able to be part of a table, because we can't know each other intimately just on Sunday, just what we're doing here. Tim Keller, this was some time back, but he tweeted out, he said, everyone says that they want community and deep friendship. I think we'd all agree. We want community with deep friendship. However, because it takes accountability and commitment, we run the other way. How often is that true in our lives? And man, I just, I, I, need, I need community. I need friendship. I'm lonely. Whether you use the words or not, I can tell when somebody's lonely. I can tell when, when, they, when, they, when they need that. But because it takes accountability, because it takes commitment, we often run the other way. We want that as long as we feel like we're on top of our game. But as soon as we're not on top of our game and we're, we're, we're somewhere else, we don't want it. But we don't need to run from community. We need to le lean into community, allow others to speak the truth in love to us as we maintain unity, operate out of our God-given gifts, and grow to spiritual maturity. So how do we apply this? How, how do we apply this to our lives? I think first off, it's healthy for us to all remember where we came from. Look back at our first value of the gospel. We all have a story. We all have a past. But it's just as important now to remember where we are now because of God's grace. That what he has given us in Christ. And that Jesus reframes our understanding of family by saying, whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and my sister and my mother. And God has graciously invited us into this family of love and calls all believers to live interdependent relationships with, of love with one another. That's why we believe in this. This is why we fight for this, because this is the way that God has designed it and called us to attain to maturity. And so the obvious implication for a passage like this is that Christ wants to create a people, not isolated individuals to believe in him, but a family. The New Testament assumes that every Christ follower is part of a local church. Which is why I believe, and I may be the only one in the room that believes this, but I firmly believe that belonging to a local church family should be more important than where you go to school, where you work, where you work out, the club that you belong to. And here's why I say that. And I know I can get pushed back. I observe people, uh, people watcher, and observer. <laughs> um, I love doing that. And you watch and people live their lives and you go, man, they prioritize everything around that thing, that workout, that club, this group they're part of. But it saddens me as a pastor when I see that people don't do that with their church if they are in Christ. And so that's why I, I, I say that, and that's why I firmly believe that. And once again, not just for those who went to seminary. I know I'm probably supposed to, I'm like, yes, like, you get paid to say that, right? I'm like, no, like, I firmly believe that. Even when I wasn't doing what I'm doing now, that's how my life is postured. And this is how God intends us to live out our faith and love for one another within this context of community, what we call family. Yes, our ultimate need is Jesus, and we are dependent on him for everything. But we're also members of a body, and we're dependent on one another. I need you, and you need me. And so belonging to a healthy church family means maintaining unity, using our unique gifts to serve one another, and growing in spiritual maturity by advancing Jesus' mission together. And that is what we are called to do. So let me pray for us, and then we will respond in worship as a family this morning. God, we thank you for another week that we can gather as a church family. God, some of our family members are missing this morning. 
Some of them might be online. Some of them might be doing something else. But God, that you have called us collectively together. That you have chosen us and you've chosen to put us as a church family who are to maintain unity, to serve one another through our unique gifts, and to advance your mission together here in Portland and beyond. God, I pray that we would value this family you have given us. I pray that when we gather, it's not just something to do on a weekend when there's nothing else better to do. But God, I pray that we value this to the point that it pains us when we have to be other places. That it pains us when we have to take a trip that because we're missing out on being part of the family that you've called us to be. God, thank you for these people. I thank you for all those who are part of Sojourn. And God, we pray for those that will, Lord will, enjoy the journey and join this family this year. It's in your name. Amen. Let's stand together. sing this um, last song out as a prayer together as a church family with our with God, God the Father at the head.
Lord, we do pray this morning that your name would be hollow, that your name would be glorified as we love one another as a church, as we live out the gifts that you've uniquely given each of us. We pray that your kingdom would come from you and that your will would be done in our lives and in this city. We ask all these things in your name. Amen. Okay, Sojourn, go and be the church.